telemedicine. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. Uh, I am part of the Tabib.mt team, um, a leading telehealth platform here, um, here in Malta. And um, today I am joined by uh, Profs Victor Grek and also uh, Dr. Malcolm Falso. Um, and together we will be discussing um, telemedicine here on the island, um, where it's sprouted out from, where it's come from, um, and how it is developing at this point in time. Um, so let's start with telemedicine in general, okay? Um, so as we all know, uh, you know, COVID did obviously um, sort of create a new space for telemedicine to be introduced here on the island. However, how long, uh, how, how much do we actually know about it, where it's actually coming from? Um, profs, from a medical point of view, um, have these conversations been happening for a very long time? Or have these conversations only been happening because the awareness just sprouted out from um, COVID itself? Good question. Like they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So even back in the early mid 90s, when the internet came about, we had telemedicine happening in the sense that, for example, people who went to distant places like military, uh, evacuating wounded soldiers out in the fields in third world countries. People could consult with specialists in highly specialized centers about things they were seeing, trauma to deal with, unusual diseases. So obviously if you're in the middle of tropical Africa and you find something, something unusual, you can, for example, contact the London School of Tropical Medicine and send pictures for example, and have some expert giving you advice. So it's been around for a long time. But obviously with COVID, um, <laughs> there's been a huge, huge, huge mushrooming of demand for this because people do not want to go out. And it's one of these things like once you become accustomed to not having to go out of the house unless you absolutely have to, not having to venture out into this ridiculous traffic and then having to contend with finding a parking space, then I think everyone can see the advantage if one can possibly not avo avoid facing COVID, going out in traffic and having to find a parking space. I think everyone agrees that this is beneficial for everyone. Thank you, Professor Greg. Um, uh, and Malcolm, from a legal point of view, um, you know, have, have, have these conversations been happening in, in the past as well? Um, uh, you know, may, maybe you could uh, elaborate on that, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think as Victor pointed out, I mean, this is, this is not a, a new phenomenon. It has been around for, um, uh, for multiple purposes. I, I, I mean, in particular, for the purpose of creating or facilitating um, the ability to provide medical services uh, by practitioners to, to their patients. Um, COVID being the global pandemic that it is, has obviously exacerbated, I think, the need for that debate to come back to the fore and to consider the implications of, 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 of telemedicine applying both within, within a singular jurisdiction as well as um, across borders. So how exactly are we going to allow um, or how are we going to, how are we going to adjust um, what currently, what already exists in terms of regulatory framework, in terms of existing rules, in order to ensure that um, telemedicine um, becomes a workable solution. I mean, similarly, uh, Victor mentioned, mentioned uh, traffic, you know, whereas you have the, the whole mobility debate, which has which has grown in proportions over the last few over the last few few months um, because of the the wish to return to 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 a new normal which is a better normal so i think the debate for uh, for telemedicine for adjusting for making those adjustments which are necessary um, in the legal sphere that is the part of that is the part which 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 i would focus on um, um, what adjustments would need to be made in order to ensure that this can that this can be you know a feasible solution to what is to what is perhaps an everyday problem which has been there for for many many years and what's interesting I think looking at you know we've mentioned we've mentioned COVID but when you think about it over the past few years um, there have been a number of other pandemics which have not been proved to be enough however I think to stimulate um, this move from 
the way we know telemedicine now to what we want it to be in future. You've had Zika, you've had Ebola, you've had other pandemics. And now I think the, the thrust really is there to, to, to do what's necessary to ensure that telemedicine will be here to stay um, post, post COVID. That's something very interesting, actually. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, you, you, you raised a very um, good point. You know, you, you uh, started to compare um, sort of COVID uh, with, with, uh, with other outbreaks in uh, the past. So in your honest opinion, what do you think actually is the main difference, um, you know, given, given COVID ri right now with regards to obviously the push for telehealth services to, you know, to actually be um, uh, sort of pushed out further, especially here on the island? Um, sorry for the long procedure each time. <laughs> uh, um, I think really it is because, I mean, at least in my, in my 40 years, despite there having been, you know, past disasters and past pandemics, I don't think there has anything, anything so serious, um, so close to home. And this across the world this is this is this is global and i mean profs will correct me if i'm wrong but i mean at least from what i can recall there has never been anything on this scale um in the past and and i think it's also when you consider the 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 the, the strait of the population the demographics here those which are most heavily impacted by the pandemic and when you look at um when you look at the the elderly in particular who are those, those, those that, 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 that um, part of the population which generally perhaps may be subject to certain limitations in so far as, as, as mobility is concerned, in so far as access to uh, you know, their, medical, uh, their medical practitioner. Um, I think that has all had, uh, all, uh, that all of that has had a, a significant impact. Also, I think the, the need to protect our our frontliners, our, our medical practitioners, the need to keep them behind a screen as much as possible to ensure that, you know, given the, the, the acute need for them to remain fit and healthy um, to take us through, to take us through this, this pandemic, I think that has, again, uh, differentiated, uh, created, been a, an important differentiator between, between past um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, diseases. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, Oh, and profs, um, from, from, from a medical point of view now, um, obviously, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, why, why hasn't um, telemedicine ever taken off here on the island? Is it, is it mainly a uh, sort of um, cultural issue here? Um, you know, is, is, is there, is there the, the fantastic need to actually uh, educate the whole um, culture for, for, for the necessary change to actually happen? And um, building on building on that as well, uh, how you know from from ov obviously your experience work, w working in the field and you yourself being so um, vocal about telemedicine and, and and how it needs to be pushed forward, uh, could you give us some more insights in as to how uh, it has developed, um, comparing it to ev ever since COVID started, and prior to actual COVID as well? Well, quite simply, prior to. COVID, there was no actual framework like Tabib set up. There was no catalyst for people to bother to go through the effort to set up this sort of service because it takes time, it takes money, it takes effort, it takes commitment, it takes investment. So given COVID, it became pretty clear that something like this needed to be done. So shuttling back and forth between the two questions. People used to think that you had to have a face-to-face -face interview with a doctor for things to be done. Now let's, let's take some actual examples. Take, for example, dermatology. In most cases, a dermatology con um, consultation, for example, can be done online. Take a psychiatry interview or a psychology interview again. Although you need to see the visual cues, how the patient is behaving, how the patient is responding, it might actually be simpler online because the patient's face is revealed to you, whereas if the patient is sitting close to you, we have to be wearing this sort of thing so as not to potentially infect each other. So the stimulus was, in recent times, we have not had 
anything this, this scale. I mean, the last big one, really big one, was the Spanish flu pandemic, which was actually much worse. But back in 1918, there was no internet, so there was no option to have any of this available to us as it is now. Now, I want to be clear here. There are some things where you cannot do it unless you are face to face. But if you have, I speak about pediatrics, I've even managed to examine throats because cameras nowadays on mobiles are so good that although I can't be physically there looking down a child's throat, a good picture will suffice. And then some things you ask the parents to do. So you'd be surprised how much you can do with telemedicine, but you can't do everything. And this is where the legal aspect comes in and the medical legal aspect comes in. We have to be aware as doctors and to some extent the patients as well. I mean, if you've got abdominal pain and it's acute and you know, this could be potentially appendicitis, if you've got chest pain, this could be a heart attack, you go to hospital or you see your doctor face to face, depending on what you have. So there has to be an element of common sense by the patient and an element of wisdom by the doctor. This is not good enough. I need to see you come to hospital, come to clinic, whatever. I hope that answers the question. Uh, Michael, if I, if I may interject on this point, because there's a, yep. there's a very interesting facet um, uh, to this question, which is um, the, the, the wisdom, or let's call it you know, common sense, what you get with experience as well as a medical practitioner. I think you will know that for certain things you need to, you need to draw a line. No, it is simply not sufficient for me to look at, at something or interview someone over, over a particular platform for me to be able to take a considered view and therefore the, there is no replacement in that case for the, for the physical interaction with the patient. But I think that the, the beauty of telemedicine is that if, 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 if through that you can cut off or, or remove, eliminate a lot of the time wastage which goes in, which goes in the process of um, uh, getting to a particular point, point, place in order to carry out this, 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 this uh, physical inspection, let's call it that, or visit. Um, uh, uh, if, you can, if you can create the convenience and the cost efficiency of actually providing the service as well but in a different medium, I think then that, that, further, um, that further justifies um, the, use for, the use for the platform. And um, combined with that, I think it's important to mention that, uh, yes, we've made comparisons with, you know, with, with, 19, with 1918, but even more recently, the reality is that um, the kind of platforms which are available, which are available nowadays, the kind of technology, uh, the ability potentially to regulate this technology, is there, um, uh, whereas it was not there, whereas it was not there in the past. There, uh, from a legal perspective, there are still significant hurdles that we need to go through, and perhaps we can delve into them uh, in, in a bit more detail later. But, um, but I think we are definitely place now we are in the right place at the right time to take this to the proverbial next next mm -hmm. level thank you very much for that um, uh, it was obviously very interesting and and uh, and yes profs i can i can uh, i can definitely vouch um, you know for 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 what you're actually saying because obviously uh, you know within within the past months i have i have been um, having a lot of uh, discussions with uh, with uh, numerous of uh, people uh, you know who 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 would be stakeholders in in the in the sort of uh, telemedicine um, front, and uh, and yes, for example, one of one of the uh, main questions that you know that uh, that I am asked from uh, that I am asked about you know from from coming from a very hesitant um, place is uh, is from HR managers, for example, um, you know saying saying you know they they're a bit reluctant to actually believe that uh, you know that. Uh, Sort of te telemedicine can can prove to be um, useful for their employees, for example, in the sense that employees might um, feel it that it is easier to sort of um, you know fake sick sometimes. You know what I mean? Because uh, because then they you know then they might um, actually think that you know that because I'm behind the screen, then you know then the sort of doctor that I'm that I'm speaking to wouldn't you know wouldn't really uh, catch me out in a way. You know what I mean? Um, 
uh, as in from, from again from your experience, um, how 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 can you uh, you know rest assured these these sort of HR managers that listen, although it's behind the screen, um, there are many many different ways of of how you can tell that uh, that a person is sick, for example. Well, you have to remember that medicine is history and examination, so especially in pediatrics anyway, a large part of what we do is looking at the child and talking to the parents, not just the physical examination. This is the same with adults. So someone might, I'm sorry to have to delve into adult medicine and into people trying to fool people to take sick leave, but since we're there, it's, it's, it's probably, probably pointless trying to fool any of us that you've got back pain when we are a bit experienced because if you're just not going to slip past us unless we let you. <laughs> so there are ways, yes. I'm not going to reveal them on camera, though. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you don't need to, don't worry. <laughs> and um, uh, Malcolm, with, with them, uh, you know, I mean, from, from, from a legal aspect now, and uh, I mean, is there any form of current legal framework surrounding telehealth here on the island, or, or is it still uh, you know, being uh, processed and being developed? Um, so, as, as, as we can see, I think, from many, other, from many other areas, not only telemedicine, often regulation has a hard time keeping up with, with innovation, which, with technological advances. And that is probably the same, that's probably the situation in the case of telemedicine. I think the, the starting point always has to be the regulatory framework which already exists. So the regulation of healthcare professionals, the regulation of, of data. Let's keep in mind that we are here dealing with the most sensitive type of personal data um, that, that, one can, that, that one can find and therefore the most heavily regulated from a, from a GDPR perspective. Um, uh, so so uh, that's why I spoke about adjustments earlier. I think, no, there is, there, is, there is no set regulatory framework for telemedicine. But to give you an example, us as a firm, um, uh, what we have done when we started receiving inquiries about the setting up of um, uh, telemedicine uh, platforms, you know, we started looking at it from from, from various different angles. So, you know, getting, uh, putting together a, uh, a, a multidisciplinary team which could focus on, on the consumer aspects, the medical aspects, technology, you know, innovation, uh, innovative services, um, and, and obviously data protection. So it's a matter of looking at what already exists. I mean, we identified um, multiple um, pieces of, of, of local legislation which would be relevant to consider um, to, 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 um, to, ensure, to create a regulatory framework for telemedicine that, that works um, and seeing where adjustments need to be made and also you know, being clear as to where certain lines need to be drawn um, uh, to make it clear that no changes would actually be possible whether you are dealing with face-to-face um, with a face between a face-to-face -face service and, an, and, a, and on, an online service. So, for instance, if uh, at law you are obliged to exercise utmost, um, utmost care and, and diligence and skill in the performance of your functions, the fact that you are doing so remotely does not exonerate you um, from, the, um, from, the, from, the, from, the, from your obligations, from your responsibility at law and potentially from the liability which may arise as a result of you not, not fulfilling um, those or meeting those, uh, those, those standards. Thank you for that. Um, and, um, uh, you know, because time is running out, uh, if, the, if, there is, you know, if, if there is anything, uh, you know, any form of predictions medically and legally, uh, you know, that you, that you see in the forthcoming, you know, imminently and gradually as well, uh, what would these predictions actually be? Uh, do you see teleconsultations actually gaining a lot and a lot of traction over here? Uh, do you see telemedicine, you know, growing into uh, into what 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 we all wanted to grow into, basically? Or could could you give us some some insight on that? Maybe um, with uh, Prof. Greg starting, please. I think that for as long as we have COVID around and things are a little bit quiet out there people may still be tempted to some extent to go to doctors, despite the fact 
that, okay, waiting rooms are ideally empty and that's how we work, but you're still at some risk, small risk, but at some risk. But I am a pragmatic man and I suspect that as the traffic eventually builds up to what it was and parking spaces vanish into the black hole that they used to be before COVID, I think this will become an increasingly attractive way of doing things. That's what I think. And just drawing a parallel on the way I, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm, I'm performing, my, 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 performing my duties towards clients. Nowadays, it is quite clear that post-COVID, um, uh, things will change in the way that we meet clients, interact with clients, and the way we network and reach out to, to other practitioners from, from, from other countries. I think traveling time or, or, or the need to travel for face-to-face -face meetings will be somewhat reduced because the experiment on, uh, you know, f for using uh, remote, uh, remote means of communication for the holding of meetings and the closing of transactions um, and but in some other jurisdictions even for the holding of court sittings, to give you an example, they've been successful effectively. So, you know, why return to the old normal which, uh, which, which was ridden with certain unnecessary um, inefficiency. So my outlook for the future is a positive one in so far as telemedicine is concerned. And, and, and at, at an EU level, I think there will be a strong drive to try to, to harmonize, to try to bring some form of um, um, uh, um, um, harmony or conformity amongst member states in the manner in which we are going to regulate something which is offered online, which is therefore of its very nature, not tied to what is happening in one particular country. You know, we're trying to look at a framework which will cover the whole of, of Europe, where you may have, you know, an, uh, um, a, a, a patient of Maltese descent who is living in a country which perhaps is not necessarily English speaking or where the patient might not feel comfortable dealing with, with, with practitioners he has met there. The ability to, to call Profs Greg, um, mm -hmm. And, and be visited online and still, you know, and still get what he would have got had he been sitting in the same room as, as, as I am in so far as the treatment, the diagnosis is concerned, also the treatment, even the ability potentially to have, you know, e-prescriptions, which is something which already exists. So very interesting times ahead and I think it's, I think it's important that, you know, telemedicine um, takes this, this opportunity. It's an unfortunate opportunity, but it's, it's one nonetheless, and I think we need to make the most of it to ensure that this can improve the way things are post-pandemic. Post I completely agree with you, Malcolm, and I obviously completely agree with you, Prof. Greg, as well. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much for, for uh, tuning in. Um, uh, if uh, you obviously, if you as the viewer wants to dissect that epic one hour and a half journey to actually visit a doctor for 10 minutes and dissect it into only a 10 minute co conversation from the comfort of your own sofa, uh, kindly visit tabib.nt. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malcolm Fadson. Thank you, Prof. Victor Grek. Um, I wish everyone a lovely, lovely day.